This morning we are going to be dealing with the mother's request, which comes from Matthew 20 verses 21 through 28, and we'll go ahead and dive directly into the text on this one. But we are going to, uh, before we get directly to our core verse this morning, uh, I do think that there is a little bit of setup that is required here. So we're going to go ahead and sort of provide some both scriptural context and also some context of the characters that we're dealing with, because I think that that plays a pretty important role in this particular story. One thing that is kind of interesting, this is the only uh, time that we see this story come up anywhere in the Gospels. This is only contained in Matthew. I'm not exactly sure why that is the case. Maybe the writers of Mark and Luke just didn't see it as prominent or didn't feel like it was worth repeating at this point. Uh, but this is the only time where we see this in the gospel account. We also see women following Jesus frequently. So while we don't see a ton of interaction between Jesus and the women that were his followers, it is something that is not uncommon either. It's, it's not something that's a huge portion of the gospels, but considering especially how brief the gospels are, it's not that unusual to see women that are following Jesus, women sort of in his contingency with disciples that are following him around. Uh, we see it maybe less frequently than the 12 disciples specifically, but it's not at all uncommon to see women sort of traveling with Jesus and learning uh, from him. So why is it that some of these women that are, are, that are following around Jesus and, and sort of with the disciples, why is it that none of the women are counted amongst the twelve? Since it seems like they're kind of around him all the time, why would they not be included in that group when Jesus says that, you know, he, he brought the twelve together or something like that? Because I think there's two or three different answers here. Maybe because men wrote the Gospels, so they didn't bother to put them in. <laughs> <laughs> well, now they include them in a lot of different places, though. Uh, maybe culturally, because men did write the Gospels, there was a little less emphasis put there. That's certainly possible. And you don't see any emphasis of, of a woman actually being directly asked to follow him like Jesus asked the Twelve. Mm -hmm. um, I think women were very attuned and, and I think they were smart with regard to their following and discipleship by, by all means, but Jesus did not specifically call any of them to be one of the Twelve. Basic could could be an aspect of that certainly. Uh, men, maybe we need to be kicked in the pants a little bit more to get to do something, and women just kind of saw something and followed along. Uh, we see women, for example, the one that washed his feet, or the uh, the the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. Now the Samaritan woman didn't follow him uh, in the the very literal sense, uh, but. But we do see maybe he doesn't call women out the way that he did Levi or Peter or Philip, that kind of thing. And so that's, you know, a possibility, I think, that, that might play into this. Um, part of it would, I think, fairly obvious because it was seen as a leadership role. Uh, apostleship is something the apostles were leaders in the church later. And, of course, women, because of the, the roles that they play in our church worship, in the church family, is a little bit different. That might be one of the reasons. I think it was actually one of the primary reasons they were not included amongst the Twelve. Another one that I thought about is a lot of the women that he talks to are women with families. Think about it. The women that we see following him most often would have been women that didn't have families. And so we have like Mary Magdalene who had demons cast out. She probably had either lost her family ties or her, her family ties were not as strong as some of the other women he would encounter. And so maybe the reason with the woman we're gonna look at today, the mother of James and John, maybe the reason that they were less apt to follow him all around Judea is because they had families to take care of. And we see this even today in church life that it's not uncommon for couples to go on a mission trip, for example, together, but it's also not uncommon to see the man go on a mission trip by himself and the mom stays home and takes care of the kids. And so uh, this is, you know, just a cultural possibility as a matter of convenience. The apostles and, and other men that were following him may have just had a little bit more freedom to be able to do that. And another thing to consider too, what they were doing was fairly dangerous. 
There were people that were after Jesus all the time, that wanted to do him harm, that wanted to harm his apostles. And so part of it may have also been Jesus' own desire to protect women and being a little bit more, just like we are in our society today, uh, a little more willing to put men in harm's way. And so uh, it's not that he wanted that, obviously, but he was maybe less willing to put a woman in harm's way in the same way that he would have uh, Peter or James or Philip or one of the other apostles. So I think there's a number of different reasons we could look at that maybe uh, Jesus chose his, his inner circle, the 12 disciples, uh, the 12 apostles as men only. And uh, some of the people following him were whole families. This is another thing that we don't see as prominent throughout the gospel. Like we don't see a, a family just traveling him th the entire three years of his ministry. We don't really see that often, but it's not super bizarre to see whole families following him, to hear him teach for a little while, maybe just in the home city where they live, but they would follow him around to hear his teachings. Uh, an interesting question here in this episode, where is Zebedee? I think that that's one thing that the Bible doesn't really address in kind of the same way. It doesn't address, where's Joseph? We see Joseph when Jesus is a baby. We see Joseph when Jesus is 12. But we don't see him again. And we don't know what the reason is for that. The gospel writers don't give us any insight into that. Perhaps he's off somewhere. Perhaps he died. I think that that's probably the most likely scenario, that Joseph has passed away at some point in the... Uh, years between Jesus being 12 years old and Jesus being 30. That seems to be the most likely one, especially when you consider that life expectancy was not incredibly high in this day and age. And perhaps that's what happened to Zebedee. Maybe Zebedee has, has passed and he's no longer with James and John and his wife. Uh, it's also possible that Zebedee is not a follower of Christ. And so maybe the mother and the sons bought into it, but the father still held to Jewish traditionalism. And so he's present, he's alive, he's just not here in the Gospels because he doesn't believe in Jesus. That's a possibility as well. So there's a number of different reasons why Zebedee might not be here. So with that being said, let's go ahead and look at the verses directly before the passage we're going to be looking at today because I think that this does a really good job of setting us up for what we're going to be looking at here because if we were to just look at the text, we might lose this sort of before context and what Jesus has just been talking about. So if somebody would volunteer to read Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19 for us. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem on his way. He took the twelve aside and said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he'll be risen to life. Okay, so this little episode here where Jesus is telling them what's going to happen to them when they go up to Jerusalem, a couple things I want you to notice about this. First of all, it's very personal. This is just apparently the inner circle, which I find interesting. And so this is going to lead us to an interesting question. When it says that he took just the 12 aside by themselves, does it mean that uh, the, the wife of Zebedee, James and John's mom, is she part of this conversation or does she come up after the conversation? We don't really know. It could just be that kind of like the uh, 5,000, he's only counting the 12 disciples there, but their families were with them. I kind of get the inclination, though, from this passage that maybe she's not privy to this conversation that Jesus is talking specifically to his 12, and then a very short time after this conversation takes place, the mother of James and John shows up. Also, this is the first time Jesus is very specific and plain spoken about what will happen to him. Because we've seen him talk about it symbolically. We've seen him talk about it sort of in parable form, talking about, for example, the temple being destroyed and then his body being raised up in three days. He's talking about his body, but of course he's using the symbolism of the temple, the temple of his body being destroyed. And so this is the first time that I'm aware of in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus plain sa just comes out and says directly, we're going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to take me prisoner, they're going to flog me, and then they're going to crucify me. I mean, there's not a lot of mystery left with that. He, he comes out and says it directly. And I think part of the reason he may have done this, the reason that he took his disciples aside to talk to them about this and tell them in plain, 
I say English, but of course it was probably Aramaic, but plain language that uh, his, he's about to be crucified. I think part of the reason he may have done that is because the apostles, and I don't mean to wag my finger or anything because I'm not sure I would have done any better, but I don't think that they get it a lot of the times. And we get pretty strong indications from other portions in the gospel that even really close to the crucifixion, like the night before, they didn't seem to really get it or seem to really believe him that he was going to be taken by the Romans and the Jews and be crucified. And so it may have been that Jesus was like, all right, I've, I've given them a symbolism. It's clearly not getting through. They need to understand what's going to happen, uh, which I feel a great deal of sympathy for the apostles because I kind of feel like this is the explanation I would have needed. Jesus, take me aside and just say without any symbolism or metaphors, just say, look, this is exactly what's going to happen. And so that may be what's happening here, too, is that Jesus tells them this because he knows they've had some trouble understanding what he's saying in the past. So let's go ahead and look at the passage we're actually going to be focusing on this morning. If somebody would offer to read Matthew 20, verses 20 through 23. And the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, We are able. And he said to them, My cup you shall drink. But to sit on my right and on my left, that is not mine to give. But it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. Okay, so... In this verse, we have the mother of James and John very plainly just coming out and asking for something that would be a great honor, very prestigious. So let's look at this request first of all. Was it wrong for her to make this request? That is true. Uh, there's a, a certain level of maybe entitlement, but I don't even know if that's 100% correct. Now, there is some show of humility because it says that she goes before him bowing down and that kind of seems to be the same language that we see, for example, with Jacob who goes up to Esau and he bows down several times and so he goes a little bit and bows. That's Based on the way the text read, it kind of seems like it's something similar to that and so there was some, some level of prostration. There's some level of humility because she understands that he is a person of authority and sort of defers to him. But you're right that I think this could... She thought her son. <laughs> I think I mean, so. She's a mother, what do you think? Right, I, I think that that is part of it. What, what were you going to say? I just said she's got nothing to lose. I mean, she's got respect. She shows that. And, um, you know, if you don't ask for something good, you'll never get it. Yeah, that might be part of the calculation. I really think it may have been. It, it may have been sort of her thinking, well, the worst he can say is no. Which, I mean, may have very well been what she thought. Is that, because this is late in Jesus' ministry. He's right before he's about to go to Jerusalem. So... Maybe like, okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and sort this out and have this set so it's, it's there in the future. I mean, like my dad used to say when I was going to job interviews, the worst they can say is no. And so don't be afraid to ask. And so maybe that was part of the thought process. I don't know. Uh, but this kind of goes to what you were saying. Moms tend to be the best and sometimes even unreasonable advocates for their children. I mean, I think that We've all seen aspects of this in moms before, and, and usually it's a good quality. I think God designed moms to be this way, to think highly of their children and encourage them, because, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody, but in my mind, it's like, well, if my mom doesn't think I can do it, like, there's, there's no hope for me to accomplish this, whatever it is, because she's my biggest cheerleader. And so I think that it might kind of be like that. I don't know if any of you in here are Seinfeld fans, but there's like this hilarious little back and forth between Jerry and his mom that he's talking about this guy that doesn't like him and she goes he doesn't like you like she can't believe that there's some and my favorite part is right afterward uh she turns around to her husband's like Morty can you believe he doesn't like him and Morty's just like ah, I could see it like <laughs> just just the difference in moms and dads I mean generally that's how it is and I think that it could be that what we're seeing here is a very human very motherly side of the, the mother of James and John is that she thinks, well, well, my sons have given an awful lot for the cause. They've been following uh, Jesus around for three years now, and they've been very faithful. And I mean, John, he's, he's part of the inner circle. He saw the transfiguration. Why shouldn't he be 
on the left and the right, and, and she seems to be a, a pretty proud advocate for that. And I don't think that that's necessarily a terrible thing. Uh, I think that that's part of, I hate to say programming, but just kind of the way that God made women, that, that they are supposed to think of their children and hold them in high esteem in that way. Uh, works like you had all these works that you had to do mm-hmm. to get to heaven and so if you could like if you could talk to Jesus and make sure that your children had a spot in heaven like you know in her mind whether it was the right or the left like they were going to heaven so if she could I don't know if she could like as a mother if she could make herself know that they were going to be there mm-hmm. you know on one side or the other then I mean that could have also I, what she was doing was making sure, you know, they were going where she hoped they were going. No, I, th- I think that's a good point. I mean, we, we sometimes forget when we're reading the Bible that we have the advantage of hindsight. Like, we can look back through all of Jesus' teachings and reflect on them and that kind of thing. Uh, she has been with Jesus, you know, on and off for some time. Her sons have been with him basically the whole time. But the point is we have the ability to kind of go back and reflect and look at these things. And and we've had a lifetime to study these things, whereas they've only been with Jesus for about three years now. And their concept of heaven, like you said, was still developing and and still trying to understand how all of that worked. And so there may have been some misunderstanding. And the thing is, I think the point you bring up is good because isn't that kind of how Jesus reacts to it too? Because Jesus is not afraid to scold people when they're wrong. I mean, he's, he's actually pretty good at it. And he doesn't seem to do that here. So I think Jesus chalks this up more to ignorance than some kind of malice or some kind of internal problem that he has to address here. And I think, no, go ahead, go ahead. Even if he died and was raised upon the third day, in their mind it still could be an earthly kingdom. Yeah, it could have been. And, And that may have been more of the idea. I think that especially this late in the ministry, they're starting to get a better understanding of what he's talking about. But yeah, I, I agree. They, they could have had a much more worldly kingdom kind of mentality. I mean, there's even speculation, and I won't go into these theories here and now because it's beyond the scope of our study. Uh, there's speculation that the reason Judas betrayed Jesus was at least in part to try to prompt him to actually you know, oppose Rome and that kind of thing. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but th- there's speculation that the reason Peter was the way he was with trying to, uh, you know, cut off Malchus's ear, he's like, okay, this is it. We're going to, we're going to take back from Rome. Um, so there's, you're right. There was still much more of a earthly kingdom mindset. And, and to be fair to the apostles and to James and John's mom here, that's all they've known. Their, their entire existence has been wrapped up in the kingdom of Israel and Israel being God's promised land, and Israel being God's promised people. And so uh, this is is a transition that's going to take some time in their own theology, and I think that that is fair to bring up. Uh, Jesus' response, by the way, I think is interesting, because it takes her love of her children into account. And this is one thing that I love about the Bible, and it's it's something that gets increasingly frustrating with the way that our, our current society treats men and women as just interchangeable and there's no difference between them. Jesus doesn't do that here. In fact, when we're, we're going to look at this passage in a second. When the disciples themselves kind of make a similar request or at least have a similar conversation, Jesus gets on to them a little bit. He doesn't do that here. And there could be a number of different reasons. First of all, I think he does chalk it up a little bit more to ignorance. She hasn't been following him as long as the apostles have. But also I think it's because he understands that this is, at least in part, her own motherly instincts kicking in, and that's part of the way God made her. And so because of that, you notice that his response, telling her that she doesn't understand what she's asking, takes her motherly instincts to protect her children into account. It doesn't oppose it or say that that's a bad thing. It actually sort of exemplifies it and says, as a mother, believe me, you don't want your children to go through what I'm about to have to go through. And so it actually takes her motherly love into account and uses it as a positive and as a teaching moment, as opposed to saying that because of that, she's wrong. I think that that's very interesting as well. And I think that it also says an awful lot about Mary. 
Because you think about this, her son is about to go through this. I know that we don't usually think about Mary when we're looking at this passage, but you think about that. He's saying, you do not want your sons to go through what I'm about to endure, knowing full well that his mother is about to go through exactly what he's about to have to endure. And she's going to have to see that. And so I think it, it actually speaks quite a bit to his own mother's spirituality and her spiritual strength and endurance that she's going to have to have as she goes through this alongside Jesus. And uh, was her request, uh, was this her request or did her sons put her up to it? I think that that's an interesting question here. What do you think? You think this is all coming out of their mom's head or is this something that James and John ask her to ask him? Well, the scriptures kind of show, portray it as more of a joint venture. Uh, I, it is, there is a parallel passage in Mark where it talks about James and John actually coming and asking these questions and the mother's left out of that. Right. So because of that kind of comparison there and that, that similar passage, it, it seems to indicate that it was something that they all kind of had this mind to try and request. Uh, that it wasn't just solely on her shoulders. I think that's, yeah, I think that's a possibility. And, and to be honest, I don't know what the right answer is here. Because um, I could see it going either way. You're right, because of that parallel passage in Mark, I do kind of think of it as, as being something to where, okay, maybe they did that too, and that's separate. And this is the follow-up to that. Maybe they were even telling their mom about this, and she goes, well, why wouldn't he do I mean, I don't, I don't know. That could be it. So maybe I'll do it. Right, maybe that was the thinking, I don't know. Um, and maybe since the response to that was sort of a, a lesson in humility, she's thinking, well, if I'm requesting it for somebody else, that's, that's being humble. And so maybe this was part of the thought process, I don't know. I could also see it, and again, I'm not saying that this is what I necessarily think, I'm just saying, th saying it could be this. I could also see it going this way too. I could see it being like, no, mom, we've already asked him about that, just don't bother. He's like, no, no, I'm gonna ask, I mean, why, why not? I don't know. I could see that happening between them and, and their mom. And so I don't think there's an, an, a really good answer to this, but I do think that uh, there is an aspect of that going on here. In verse 24, um, it says, and when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers, mm -hmm. not the mom, <laughs> at the brothers. Yeah. I noticed that as well. And we're, we're, we're actually going to get to that in a second, but you're right. That, that might be part of the calculation here is that, Okay, we know his mom was saying it, but really it was them. Maybe. And like, like John was saying, there's another passage at a, seemingly at a different time where the mother is not part of this. And so this may have been something like, they've been traveling together for three years now. They know that this is not like something past what James and John would have requested. And, so, and also, it's kind of hard to get mad at someone's mom. Like, and I don't know, maybe that's why she was the one that made the request. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, I think that this is all uh, interesting to, to look at. So let's actually look at a different passage that happens not too long before this, just a couple of chapters earlier in Matthew 18, verses 1 through 6. And if somebody would go ahead and look that up and, and read this verse for us. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he was drowned in the depth of the sea. Now you notice here that Jesus' response to the disciples, as I alluded to earlier, a little bit harsher than it is toward their mom. And we looked at several different reasons why that may be the case. The ultimate reaction, as we're going to see in the next passage, is going to be very similar, or at least along similar lines. Uh, but the point is, I could see James and John sort of egging their mom on to do this. But I could also see the opposite from this verse as well. I could also see it as like, no, Mom, we've, we've already asked him about that. We've already been through that. Let, don't, don't get Jesus mad at us again. <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know how those conversations went. I think that that's an interesting thing to contemplate. Uh, but the point is, it may very well have been that, that she was acting of her own volition just because 
this is something that the apostles had already asked about themselves. And so uh, maybe that was the case here. And, and it's also possible that the uh, wife of Zebedee is not present when this lesson happens. And so they're going to get a little bit of a repeat because she wasn't here for that lesson and she didn't know about it earlier. And that's the reason that this takes place. I'm not sure. But the point is the apostles at this point probably should have foreseen this outcome <laughs> if this were the case. Uh, and, you know, to their credit, I think we also need to remember that uh, John is is pretty loyal to Jesus. I mean, he's one of the, he's the only apostle we know for a fact was at the crucifixion. And so he's part of the inner circle. He writes the gospel of John. He's present for the transfiguration. And so there's reason for the mother to see this as a reasonable request, I guess, is the way to to look at this. Um, So let's look at Jesus' response here and the way he reacts to it. Uh, Did James and John really mean their answer? Because let's also remember the context here. What just happened is Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go into Jerusalem. I'm going to be captured, flogged, and crucified. That happens directly before this passage. And so he says, are your sons able to drink of the cup I'm about to drink of? And they say, we are. Do you think they meant it? Do you think they were speaking in ignorance? Or do you think that they were 100% sincere? I think they were sincere. Any other thoughts? I think they were sincere in the moment. <laughs> Just like Peter was sincere. In the moment. I was going to say know, sincerely ignorant. Yeah, I think I, I, exa- that's a good way of putting it. Sincerely ignorant. That's, that's a good way. To that's put such it a lawyer response. Just combine both I answers. <laughs> but, Cover all angles. <laughs> But I think in the moment, yeah, they they believed that they could they could do just what Jesus said. All right, this is what I'm about to do. Can you handle it? And, oh yeah, sure. Just like what Peter said. Yeah, I, I'm not going. I would die before I would. You know, I would deny you. Yeah. Right. I, I don't. I don't think Jesus implies, nor does the Scripture imply, that Peter was in any way insincere when he made that proclamation. That's exactly right. And, and I, don't think is, I don't think they're insincere here either. I don't. I don't think so. Jesus, I think, if they were insincere, would probably call them out on that. Remember, he sees into the hearts of men, and so if there was some insincerity here, you would think that he would say something. But he kind of says the opposite, doesn't he? He says that they're going to partake of this cup. Whether they're ignorant or not, they're going to experience it. That's, mm-hmm. right. and that's going to be the bottom line. So. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely correct. Do you think that maybe they got it? Like maybe they were the two disciples that understood that they would have to die to become a part of this kingdom because in verse 24, when you say the ten heard it, it says Jesus called them to him. I don't know if that's just the ten or if it's the whole twelve, but he could have explained to the ten, hey, you're going to have to be a servant to be a leader, right? James and John get this. They're not really asking to be in charge of you, right? Or to lord over you or have authority over you. They, they get that they're going to have to die in order to serve. I had not considered that angle, but it may be correct. It, it may have been that James and John understood it and the others didn't. And since you brought up the ten, remember this. Who's writing this? Matthew. He's, he's one of the ten. And so I find it interesting that John does not record this episode in his gospel, but Matthew does, despite him being, quote-unquote, on the other side of it. And so I find that really interesting as well. And so Matthew was part of this group. That's a very interesting thought. Probably. I don't think I've ever thought about that either, but I think that, that could be the case just because he just... Like you said, he plainly laid it out there for them. Right, he doesn't leave any mystery in no, the lead-up to this. John could have gotten it. And they, they really could have understood it, and the other ones would think, well, they're angry and upset with them, but for the wrong reason. Again, it goes back to humility. You know, I think I've always portrayed or thought that James and John are still a little spiritually ignorant. They don't really catch it necessarily here, but they actually, maybe they do. And it could be that they're spiritually ignorant, but not quite as much as the other ten. And so they're, they're a little further down the road, but they're not quite there yet. That's also possible. And, and maybe that plays to Holly's point. I don't think you see later, later passages in Matthew, you see they're still not getting the whole picture. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you think about like in the garden, you know, Peter's chopping off ears. You know, I mean, 
that he's not getting the fact that this right. is a spiritual versus a physical kingdom. He's not getting it still there hmm. um, to some extent. I mean, I think the, the personality and the, the personableness may be taking over, maybe, um, but you still, they don't get a whole concept. Kind of like, I don't think we get the whole concept still today ourselves. I don't know if right. we'll get that eventually, but the whole idea that this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Hmm. We have such a struggle with that even though we, we may know and understand it and believe it and embrace it, but yet on the other hand, we are so entrenched on the things of this world, we get so divided, we get so distracted. And maybe that's kind of the same, the same they continue to deal with the same way. Yeah, and, and along these same lines, let's also remember the proof is in the pudding. Who abandoned Jesus? Peter, who didn't abandon Jesus? John. Right, he's, he's there with his mother. And so says to the mom, you don't know what you're asking. Then turns mm -hmm. to the brothers, are you able to drink this cup? And they say we are, and he says you'll drink it. Like he's not mad. Like mm -hmm. you're going to drink it, but I don't get to decide if you sit at my left or right. Mm -hmm. He's not even like upset really mm -hmm. for them asking that. Yeah, I don't get any indication in this that he's disappointed or upset in any way. Now there's a, an inkling of that in the earlier passage in Matthew 18. Um, not necessarily mad, but certainly using it as a teaching moment to understand, to help them understand that their mindset is wrong. But we don't really get that indication in this passage, and I think that that's very interesting. Uh, I think that they understood the physical side of the cup. I do. I think based on the context, based on everything that we've read so far, I think they got when Jesus said, are you able to take of this cup? I think they understood what that meant. What I don't think they understood is the spiritual side of it. Because were James and John going to die for the cause? Yes, James, in fact, very early. James doesn't last very long in the New Testament. John lasts the longest of all of them. But the point is, both of them wound up dying for the cause of Christ. The interesting part of that, though, is can James and John's blood forgive our sins? No. And so they could endure the physical side of it, sure. What they would not be able to do is give their blood an atonement for sins. And that's the thing that Jesus is talking about. That would make them worthy of sitting at his right and his left hand. And I think that that's what he's saying here is that what you're asking is not something I am able to give. If they could drink of my cup in the full way, in other words, the ability to live a sinless life and then give their life over as an atonement, then that would be something they, could, they, they would have earned. But the point is they, they didn't do that and they can't earn that. And that's the lesson that I think he's, he's trying to get at here. Uh, let's go ahead and read Mark 3, 13 through 17. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. And have authority to cast out demons, he appointed the twelve, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, son of thunder. So this is a designation Jesus himself gives to these brothers. I think that that is not insignificant. When we think about the sons of thunder, at least, you know, I kind of always thought of it before really studying this passage that it was more like a nickname that was sort of drummed up and then later kind of stuck. But no, this is something that Jesus himself gives them that designation. Uh, I think it, first of all, is by far the coolest nickname in the entirety of Scripture. But second of all, I do think that it reflects the kind of zeal and passion that they have because you wouldn't, you wouldn't refer to somebody in this way unless there's a good bit of that. Um, and, and what's the thing about lightning? It is powerful. It is strong. It is uh, something that you want to avoid when it's, when it's raging. And also, it's kind of indiscriminate. That's part of the problem with lightning. Uh, it, it doesn't always hit, you know, sometimes it, it hits something it should. Sometimes it hits something it shouldn't. And so I think that there's a, a kind of... Um, zeal and a kind of passion going along with these two brothers, and that's part of what makes them who they are. Uh, a real quick passage from Luke 9, verses 52 through 56. 
And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. And they did not receive him because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on their village. Is it, is it 945 already? Okay, okay. I was about to say, I was like, that seemed a little early. Okay, I got you. All right, good. Um, so anyway, this is, I think, a pretty good display of the personalities of James and John. And of course, he rebukes them here, and he is upset with them. It, it says that plainly in the scripture. Uh, but... I do think that it sort of puts on display the kind of people that James and John were, is that they, they are so loyal and so passionate that when they see disloyalty in someone else, they think that that's time for divine judgment to come on down. Now, they were incorrect in this, but I think it displays why they have this nickname and, and kind of the reason that they are the way that they are in, in this, this story that we're looking at as well. So, with all that being said... Um, actually, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and, uh, and look at this. I think by telling them that he lacked the authority to grant this request, he's modeling humility in himself, right? He's saying, I don't even have the authority to give you that. And if Jesus himself is saying to them, that's above my pay grade, I think that that is an instructional tool for them and, and their mother as well, saying, yeah, a little bit more humility would be in order here. Again, I don't think he's scolding. I don't think he's furious. I, I think that, like we've talked about before, there, there's a measure of ignorance that plays into this, and Jesus recognizes this. But I do think what he is doing is he is acting himself as an example for the mindset that they should have and they should react to trying to explain to them that this is something that is beyond even my authority to grant. And I believe that the application of Matthew 18, 1 through 6 applies here too, that he's, he's saying the same thing about uh, we, should, we should try to be humble, we should try to um, be a little bit more submissive. And it's, it's less about, you know, you should try to be more humble. I don't think that that's, you know, plainly what he's saying. That's why in the earlier passage, he uses the example of a child. He's saying, approach matters in this way with this line of thinking, and then you won't have to worry about, quote-unquote, trying to be humble later. And I think that that's the same kind of thing that we're about to see in this next passage that we're looking at. And so if somebody would quickly read Matthew 20, 24 through 28. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers but Jesus called them to himself and said you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them it is not this way among you but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant and whoever wishes to be the first among you shall be your slave just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many okay so this is kind of what I call the fallout of this passage this is Jesus reaction and he as in, in typical Jesus fashion, uses it as a moment to instruct. Um, I think we've already kind of talked about this, but why are the other ten disciples upset? Uh, I think it's a combination of two things, honestly. I think, A, they wanted that honor. We saw earlier in Matthew that they asked about it. They wanted to know who was going to be top dog in the kingdom. And so... It wasn't purely like, and, and I wish that we could give the disciples more credit here, but I don't think it was like, guys, you shouldn't be asking that. You have the wrong mentality. I think it was more like, you know, we, we'd kind of like to have that spot. And I also do think it was because a combination of both. Maybe they're thinking, look, Jesus already addressed this. He already talked about it. We already got a, a lesson on it, and we don't want to go through that again. That might have been it as well. And so that might have been part of the reason the other ten disciples are upset. And I, and I think Holly's point may have been something that played into it as well, is that maybe Jesus is just taking away the other ten as opposed to the whole twelve and giving this lesson. I'm not sure that we can know that, but it is an interesting way to look at it. Um, is it wrong to desire prominence in the kingdom? Um, normally I'd open the floor up to this, but I'm running out of time. So uh, I don't think it necessarily is, and I think we've done a good job of 
of explaining that, but I think the the ultimate understanding here is that it all goes back to motive. And I think a good way to display that is actually something uh, I stole from President Ronald Reagan. When Ronald Reagan, all throughout his political career, as president and as the governor of California, he always had two things on his desk. One of them said it can be done, but I'd like to focus on the other one. It said, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. I don't think wanting prominence in the kingdom is necessarily a bad thing. I think the reason we want it might be. If we are desiring prominence in the kingdom because it means that we will have more opportunities to serve others, I think that that actually is a good thing. I mean, I, I think when the scripture talks about, for example, seeking out the office of a bishop or an elder, it says he desires a good thing. There is some prominence there. There's some prestige there. But if you're going after it for that, you're going after it for the wrong reasons. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is trying to get across here. He's trying to explain if your motive is to g gain rank, as it were, in the kingdom, so that you may take of the same cup that I am, that you suffer the way that I suffer because it brings good to the kingdom, then I don't have a problem with you making that request. What I have a problem with is you making that request, either A, being unwilling to do that, or B, even if you are willing to do it, you're doing it because you want to add to your own prestige. Both of these things are incorrect motivations, and I think that that's really the underlying theme that Jesus is trying to get across in this lesson. Uh, that's all I had. Were there any other questions or comments before we were dismissed here? All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.